قبر محمد وال محمد صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد يا علي يا عظيم يا غفور يا رحيم أنت الرب العظيم الذي ليس كمثله الشيء وهو السميع البصير وهذا شهر أذمته وكرمته وشرفته وفذلته على الشهور وهو شهر الذي فرط صيامه علي وهو شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان وجعلت فيه ليلة القاد وجعلتها خيرا من ألف شهر فيا ذا المن ولا يمن عليك من علي بفكاك رقبتي من النار في من تمن علي وأدخل للجنة برحمتك يا أرهم الراهمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم رب شهر رمضان الذي أنزلت فيه القرآن وافترفت على عبادك فيه السيام صل على محمد وآل محمد ورزقني حج بيتك الحرام في عام هذا وفي كل عام واغفر لتلك الظنوب العظام فإنه لا يغفرها غيرك يا رحمن يا الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أفتته الثناء بحمدك وأنت مسدد للسواب بمنك وأيكنت أنك أنت أرهم الراحمين في موضع الأفو والرحمة وأشد المواقبين في موضع النكال والنقمة وأعظم المتجبرين في موضع الكبرياء والعظمة اللهم أذنت لي في دعائك ومسعلتك فاسمع يا سميه مدحتي وأجب يا رحيم دعوتي وأقل يا غفور أثرتي فكم يا إلهي من كربة قد فرجتها وهموم قد كشفتها وأثرة قد أقلتها ورحمة قد نشرتها وهلقة بلاء قد فككتها الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ صاحبة ولا ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الموت ولم يكن له ولي من الظل وكبره تقبيرا 
الحمد لله بجميع محامده كلها على جميع نعمه كلها الحمد لله الذي لا مضاد له في ملقه ولا منازع له في أمره الحمد لله الذي لا شريك له في خلقه ولا شبيه له في عظمته الحمد لله فاشف الخلق أمره وهمده ظاهر بالكرم مجد الباسط بالجود يدا الذي لا تنقص قضائنه ولا تزيده كثرة العطاء إلا جودا وكرما إنه هو العزيز الوحام اللهم إني أسألك كليلا من كثير مع حاجة بي إليه أظيما وغناك عنه قدير وهو عندي كثير وهو عليك سهل يسير اللهم إن أفوك أن ذنبي وتجاوزك عن خطيعتي وصفحك عن ظلمي واسترق على قبيه أملي وهلمك أن كثير جرمي عندما كان من خطأي وأمدي أتمعني في أن أسألك ما لا استوجبه منك الذي رزقتني من رحمتك وأريتني من قدرتك وأرفتني من إجابتك فسرت أدوك آمنا وأسألك مستأنسا لا خائفا ولا وجلا مدلا عليك فيما قسدت فيه إليك فإن عبت أني أتبت بجهلي عليك ولعل الذي أبتع عني هو خير لي لعلمك بآقبة الأمور فلم أر مولا كريما أسبر على أب لئيم منك علي يا ربي إنك تدعوني فهو لي أنك وتتهبب إلي وتبغض إليك وتتودد إلي فلا أقبل منك كأن لي التطول عليك فلم يمنع كذلك من الرحمة لي والإحسان إليك والتفضل علي بجودك وكرمك فارهام عبدك الجاهل وجد عليه بفضل إحساني إنك جواد كريم الحمد لله مالك الملك مجري الفلك مسخر الرياء فالك الإسباء ديان الدين رب العالمين الحمد لله على هلمه بعد إلمه والحمد لله على أفوه بعد قدرته والحمد لله على طول أناته في غضبه وهو قادر على ما يريد الحمد لله خالق الخال باسط الرزق فالك الإسباب ذي الجلال والإكرام والفضل والإنعام الذي بعد فلا يرى وكرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي ليس له منازع يعادل ولا شبيه يشاكل ولا ذهير يعادل قهر بعزته العزاء 
وتواذعا لأظمته العظمى فبلغ بقدرته ما يشاء الحمد لله الذي يجيبني حين أنادي ويستر علي كل أورة وعناسي ويؤذم النعمة علي فلا أجازي فكم من موهبة هنيئة قد أعطاني وعظيمة مخوفة قد كفاني وبحجة مونقة قد أراني فأثني عليه حامدا وأذكره مسبحا الحمد لله الذي لا يختك هجاب ولا يغلق باب ولا يرد سائله ولا يخيب عامل الحمد لله الذي يؤمن الخائفين وينجي الصالحين ويرفع المستدعفين ويضع المستكبرين ويحلق ملوكا ويستخلف آخرين والحمد لله قاسم الجبارين مبير الظالمين مدرك الهاربين نكان الظالمين صريخ المستسرخين موضئي حاجات الطالبين معتمد المؤمنين الحمد لله الذي من خشيته ترعد السماء وسكانها وترجف الأرض وأمارها وتموج البحار ومن يسبه في غمراتها الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي لولا أن حدانا الله الحمد لله الذي يخلق ولم يخلق ويرزق ولا يرزق ويطئم ولا يطعم ويميت الأحياء ويهي الموتى وهو حي لا يموت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ورسولك وأمينك وسفيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك أفضل وأحسن وأجمل وأكمل وأزكى وأنمى وأتيب وأتهر وأسنى وأكثر ما سليت وباركت وترحمت وتحننت وسلمت على أهد من إبادك وأنبيائك ورسلك وسفوتك وأهل القرامتك عليك من خلقك اللهم وسل على لي نمير المؤمنين ووسير رسول الرب العالمين أبدك ووليك وأخي رسولك وحجتك على خلقك وآيتك الكبرى والنبأ العظيم وسل على صديقة الطاهرة فاتمة الزهراء سيدتي نساء العالمين وسل على سبطي الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين سيد الشباب أهل الجنة وسل على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف الحادي المهدي 
وجدك على عبادك وامنائك في بلادك صلاة كثيرة ضائمة اللهم وسلي على ولي الأمر قلقائم المعمال ولا ذل المنتظر وهفه بملائكتك المكربين وأيده بروه القدس يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعله الداعي إلى كتابك والقائم بدينك استخلفوا في الأرض كما استخلفت الذين من قبلك مكن له دينه الذي ارتضيته لا أبدله من بعد خوف أمنا يعبدك لا يشرك بك شيئا اللهم عزه وعزز به وانصره وانتصر به وانصره نصرا عزيزا وافتح له فتح يسيرا واجعل له من لدنك سلطانا نسيرا اللهم اذهر به دينك وسنة نبيك حتى لا يستخفي بشيء من الحق مخافة أهد من الخال اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة قريمة تؤز بها الإسلام وأهلا وتذل بها النفاك وأهلا وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى طاعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة اللهم ما أرفتنا من الحق فهملنا وما كسرنا أنه فبلغنا اللهم المن به شعثنا واشعب به صدعنا وارتق به فتكنا وكثر به قلتنا وعزز به ذلتنا وأغن به عائلنا واغذ به أن مغرمنا واجبر به فخرنا وسد به خلتنا ويسر به أسرنا وبيز به وجوهنا وفق به أسرنا وأنجح به طلبتنا وأنجز به مواعيدنا واستجب به دعوتنا واعتنا به سؤلنا وبلغنا به من الدنيا والآخرة آمالنا واعتنا به فوق رغبتنا يا خير المسؤولين وعوس المعتين اشف به صدورنا وأذهب به غيظ قلوبنا واحدنا به لما اختلف فيهم من الحق بإذنك إنك تحدي من تشاء إلى سرات مستقيم ونسرنا به على أدوك وعدونا إله الحق آمين اللهم إنا نشخو إليك فخض نبينا صلواتك عليه وآله وغيبة ولينا وكثرة عدونا وقلة جدنا وشدة الفتن بنا وتظاهر الزمان علينا فصل على محمد وآله وعنا على ذلك بفتح منك تعجل وبذر تكشف ونصر تعز وسلطان حق تدحر ورحمة منك تجللناها وآفية منك تلبسناها برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم برحمتك في الصالحين فأدخلنا وفي علينا فارفعنا وبقأس من معين من عين سل سبيل فسكنا ومن الحور العين برحمتك فزوجنا ومن الولدان المخلدين كأنهم لؤلؤ مكنون فأخذمنا ومن ثمار الجنة وله من الطير فأتعمنا ومن ثياب السندر السي والهرير والاسترق فألبسنا وليلة القاد وحج بيتك الحرام وقتلا في سبيلك فوفق لنا والصالح الدعاء والمسألة فاستجب لنا وإذا جمعت العولين والآخرين يوم القيامة فارهمنا وبراءة من النار فاخذب لنا وفي جهنم فلا تغلنا وفي أضابك وحوانك فلا تبطلنا ومن الزقوم والضريء فلا تطعمنا وما شعاتين فلا تجعلنا وفي النار على وجوهنا فلا تكببنا ومن ثياب النار وصرابيل القطران فلا تلبسنا ومن كل سوء يا لا إله إلا أنت بهك لا إله إلا أنت فنجنا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم إني أسألك أن تجعل فيما تقضي وتقدر من الأمر المحتوم في الأمر الحقيم من القضاء الذي لا يرد ولا يبدل أن تكتبني من حجاج بيتك الحرام المبرور حجهم المشكور سعيهم المغفور ذنوبهم المكفر أن سيئاتهم وأن تجعل فيما تقضي وتقدر أن تطيل أمري في خير وآفيا وتوسع في رزقي وتجعلني ممن تنتسر به لدينك ولا تستبدل بغيري أعوذ بجلال وجهك الكريم أن ينقضي أني شهر رمضان أو يذل الفجر من ليلتي هذه ولك قبل تبعة أو ذنب تؤذبني علي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد إلهي وكف السائلون ببابك ولا ذا الفقراء بجنابك ووقفت سفينة المساكين على سعهل بحر جودك وكرمك يرجون الجواز إلى صاحة رحمتك ونعمتك إلهي إن كنت لا تغفر في هذا الشهر الشريف إلا لمن أخلص لك في سيامه وقيامه فما للمذنب المقسر إذا غرق في بحر ذنوبه وآثامه إلهي إن كنت لا ترحم إلا المطيعين فمن للعاسين وإن كنت لا تقبل إلا من الآملين فمن للمقسرين إلهي 
ربها الصائمون وفاض القائمون ونجا المخلصون ونحن عبيدك المذنبون فرحمنا برحمتك وأتقنا من النار بأفوك يا كريم يا أرهم الراهمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم أدخل على أهل القبور السرور اللهم أغني كل فقير اللهم أشبئ كل جائر اللهم اكس كل أريان اللهم اكذ دين كل مدين اللهم فرج عن كل مكروب اللهم رد كل غريب اللهم فك كل أصير اللهم أسلق كل فاسد من أمور المسلمين اللهم اشفي كل مريض اللهم سد فخرنا بغناك اللهم غير سوء حالنا بحسن حالك اللهم اكف عنا الدين واغننا من الفاق انك على كل شيء قدير برج سال سور فاتح فوق المرحومين Muminin assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kindly join me in reciting Surah Fatiha for all marhumin al-Fatiha. Muminin, we request all brothers to move as far forward as possible and kindly leave the side rooms for parents with young children. Uh, also, one of our children has misplaced his uh, pair of glasses. If anyone comes across them on the gen side, please uh, bring them up to the AV room. <clears throat> Before the majlis this evening, we will have a short health talk by the health committee. There will be two health talks and this will be held separately in the ladies and the gents, after which we will resume with the communal program once again. These will be delivered by Dr. Jabir Mirali on the gen side and Sister Farzana Huda on the ladies side. Please, can we welcome them with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. My dear brother, salamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Jabe Morali. I'm a, I'm a GP in the Southampton area and also work as a, a specialized doctor in the treatment of elderly and frail people in their own homes. Now, tonight's talk is entitled Move It or Lose It. So, inshallah, we're going to try and cover just three things today. Firstly, why we can't afford to stop moving. And then we're actually going to do a, a, a really quick five-minute exercise routine. And then, inshallah, if there's a bit of time, a, a really short Ramadan reflection at the end. So before we, got, we get to the exercise part, a quick note on why it's so important. 
So I, I introduced myself before as someone who has an interest in treating those with frailty. So what is frailty? As well as being an adjective in the English language to describe weakness or infirmness, it's actually in medicine a defined medical condition that describes a state in which multiple body systems lose their reserve or lose their strength. And it carries one of the largest increased risks in hospitalization of any condition and is one of the closest predictors of our own death. And, and this is the important bit. It is solely defined by our ability to move, not by any other medical conditions or what tablets you take or what blood tests you may have, just by how you, you move and how you, your movement has changed with time. So, so this is actually called the Rockwood Frailty Score. So this is how we score frailty syndromes. And you can see from the pictures that the difference between being a, a one or a six or seven is really defined by our movement. That's it. And please also bear in mind that this is talking about change in movement, not those who may be disabled for other reasons, just those who have had, over time, lost their strength and their balance. And so as a doctor, fundamentally, I am more interested in how you move than anything else, or how your movement has changed. And there is no tablet to treat frailty. The only thing is regular strength and balance exercises, along with health, healthy eating, is the only intervention to delay the onset of frailty or its advancement. So studies have stressed the importance of establishing a, a, a regular time dedicated to our own physical health. And we're told we should try to aim to achieve at least, at least 20 to 25 minutes, four days a week, focusing on strengthening of our limbs and improving our balance and coordination. Now, now I am supremely underqualified to lead an exercise routine. Inshallah, in the future health talks, we can have some physiotherapists or some chiropractors or maybe some of the gym-going enthusiasts to take over. And as such, I've turned to a simple exercise video for all of us to try. This is actually my favorite way to exercise in my own home. The video is designed for people who are able to stand unaided. For those who need a little more help, please do whatever movements you can. And any increased movement we can achieve is going to go a long way. Okay, so inshallah, five minutes, we're all going to get on our feet if it works and we're going to do a, a five minute exercise video inshallah Inc i'm a personal trainer who specializes in online workout content for people all over the world and i'm now delivering my first session for senior and elderly people that are stuck at home that need some content i really want to get you up get you moving get you feeling good feeling positive move your joints raise your heart rate a little bit Take it at your own pace, nice and simple, no equipment. You can do it in your socks, in your living room, on your carpet. We're gonna do 40 seconds on each exercise, followed by 20 second rest, and there's five moves in total. So keep it simple um, and just adapt it if you have to. First exercise, nice and simple. We're gonna be doing 40 seconds of high knees, just marching on the spot. So the higher you lift your knees, the more challenging it will be, the lower the easier, okay? So here we go, three, two, one. So just lifting those knees, 40 seconds, so arms out straight as you march. And as I said, the higher you lift your knees, the more hip range of motion you're gonna need. If you can't get them right up, just go shallow. Just lift them slightly off the ground. So 40 seconds, keeping your back nice and straight. Just marching on the spot. And if you wanna go a bit harder, obviously you can go a bit faster. We've got 15 seconds on the clock. So nice, high knees, marching. Good work. And then we're gonna do a 20 second rest. Last few seconds, lifting those knees. Good, in three, two, one, and relax, perfect. Right, exercise number two, we're gonna do some toe touches. So this is about rotating the spine. So you may not be able to come right down and touch the toes. You may just be up here, starting out with the arms straight, and just with a slight rotation, left to right, depending on the mobility of your spine. If you can, we're gonna go to the toes. Off we go, so 40 seconds. So nice and slow, left to right, left to right. And as I said, if you can't get down, you can just do a slight twist. Yeah, perfect, so keep it up. Left to right, keeping that spine healthy, keeping it rotating and moving. Just nice and slow, take your time. Good, keep breathing, nice deep breaths. You've got 10 seconds left. Left to right, three, two, one, 
and relax, perfect. So 20 second reps. Next one we're gonna do is a lateral shoulder raise. So just standing nice and straight. We're gonna lift our arm to the side. So focus on your shoulders here. From the side, we then go to the front, back and down. So lateral, frontal, back to the side and down. Off we go. You're gonna feel this in your shoulders. And just if you can, sort of tense that muscle there and squeeze and bring together out and down. It's good for your scapula, your shoulder mobility. So just parallel the ground, forwards, back and down. Perfect. We've got 20 seconds left on this exercise. So lift, forwards and down. So just from the side, nice straight arms, frontal, lateral, back down and repeat. And if you wanted to make this hard, you could obviously hold a little dumbbell, a little weight, a can of beans, you could hold a can of beans if you wanted to. Right, so next exercise is a shallow squat. Now, if you've got strong legs and good range of motion in your hips, you can obviously get much lower in your squat. You know, you could come right down. But if you've got, if you haven't got the range of motion in the strength, just do little shallow reps. Okay, so feet, uh, hands together and then up. So it's just a tiny little bend in the knees, open up the hips, work in the quads. So we come down and up, down and up. So you don't have to get low. The stronger you are, the more mobile you are, the lower you can get into that squat. But even if it's a tiny little two inch pulse, you're firing up these legs, getting those muscles working. Good, take your time. We've got another 10 seconds on this exercise. So really think about those quads, think about the muscles in your legs, keep them strong, keep going. Three, two, one, and relax, perfect. Right, exercise number five, the final one. We can all do this one. We're gonna get into a boxing position, into a boxing stance. So one leg back in a diagonal position, and we're just gonna throw nice straight punches. So you may find that you wanna do it that way, you might wanna have your left leg back, whatever feels natural to you. 40 seconds, let's get our heart rate up now. Let's go, so 40, 40 seconds on this one. Nice straight punches, facing forward. So if you see I'm not punching down, I'm not punching up, just eye level, as if I'm punching someone with pads right in front of me. Come on, this is gonna get your heart rate up. Brilliant, we've got 20 seconds on the clock. Keep it going. Nice fast fit, uh, fist, nice and straight. Keep the fit, uh, fist clenched. You've got 10 seconds, let's go a bit quicker, come on. Get that heart rate up, all the way. Five seconds, come on. Four, three, two, one, and we're Those who participated, you, you can see actually it, it, doesn't, it doesn't take much effort to put on a video in your own home to spend, to spend 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever you can manage, to just get your, get your muscles moving a little bit and you'll really be surprised that just a, a little bit will go, will go a really long way. Um, and as, you, as I've said before with, with frailty, once you, once you really stop moving, you really will start to lose it. So if we have time, just a very quick Ramadan reflection. <laughs> In, in reference to those who will be saved from the difficulties of the Day of Judgment, Allah says in Surah Ma'araj, in verse 23, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alladheena hum ala salatihim da'imun. Those who are constantly performing their prayers. The, the, these are the people who will be, um, who will be protected from the, day of, um, from the difficulties of the Day of Judgment. In, in other parts of the Quran, he talks about those who pray as being those who are the most successful or the true believers. And, and we will all naturally think of the spiritual successes that, that Salah brings us. But, and, and sometimes we even think of that at the expense of our physical health, that actually we become tired when we pray. But Allah in His all-encompassing knowledge is also thinking of our physical success in this life. The, the slide is sort of half cut off. Um, I'll see if, I, if you can perhaps see it on my, on my computer. Uh, so if, if, you, if you can see on my computer, on, on one half of the slide that is actually up there are the positions of Salah that we go through. From, 
from, from sajda to ruku and then standing back up into qiyam before the next rakah. On the, on the other hand of the slide was actually a, a picture of some exercises I just pulled up that were NHS recommended exercises for strengthening and balance. And the similarities are remarkably similar, especially from our sitting, you know, going back up into a rising position um, at the end of, uh, before the next rakah. There's really a, a, a massive similarity. Um, and, and this is truly something really amazing to reflect on and encourage us maybe to perform this highly recommended act even more abundantly. Um, so inshallah, let us pray to Allah to increase our ibadah in these special nights and pray that he gives us the strength to keep moving in whatever capacity we can. And just finally, just a last note that the, um, the health committee have of course been, been fundraising for a defibrillator for the Jamaat and we are, we are, I'm told, incredibly close to reaching our target. So please... Uh, Dig deep in whatever you can, and inshallah, we can, um, we, can, we can gain this really important piece of equipment for our community. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you, Dr. Jabir Merali and Sister Farzana Huda for those presentations. Mumineen, our Shah Ramadan Fund needs your support. Your donations play an instrumental role in covering the various costs essential for our community's programs which enrich our Shah Ramadan experience here at Wessex. A breakdown of what goes, on in, what goes into our budget can be seen on the screens. Costs such as niyaz, guest speakers, spiritual evenings, running costs, social and games nights all fall within our budget of 26,000 pounds. Unfortunately, we find ourselves falling short of our fundraising target. We are currently at 37% at this point in the holy month. Should we not reach our target, we will sadly have no choice but to reduce the number of iftars we have together. Over the past two weeks, we have united as a community sharing meals and participating in numerous enriching programs such as ladies' socials, ibadat nights, gent socials, with many more to come. However, we still have ground to cover to reach our goal. As we near the holy nights and continue forward, we humbly request your continued support to help us bridge this gap. Your contributions play a pivotal role in ensuring the success and continuation of these vital programs. Together, let's ensure that our community remains vibrant and thriving. Ways in which you can donate are displayed on the screen. Once again, we thank you for your ongoing support. Mominin, especially to the brothers, we would like to advise the brothers that the only area where smoking is permitted within the grounds of the mosque is designated smoking areas which are located on the side of the building, round the corner from the gents' entrance. Smoking anywhere else within the grounds is not permitted at any time, and thank you for your cooperation in this matter. After the main program tonight, there will be a ladies' social night to be held in the ladies' section of the main hall, 
We encourage the ladies to attend in large numbers for a night full of laughter, games, good conversations, and inshallah, sehri will be served. There will also be a simultaneous gents baraza night tonight with a fire pit to be held on the grounds of Darul Zahra. We look forward to seeing you all there. Inshallah, this Ramadan, we will once again be holding the Bring a Friend Day on Monday, the 8th of April, 2024, between 5.30 p.m. and 7 p.m. This is for school age children only and will give them an opportunity to invite a school friend and their family to the center for them to experience what life is like with us during what life is like for us during the holy month of Ramadan. There will be tours of the center and lots of fun activities including art and craft activities. Kindly register your child and their friend using the registration forms circulated via email and WhatsApp. We would like to request all Mu'mineen to make an effort to help the environment and reduce the cost burden for the Jamaat by bringing your own cups or mugs from home. You can imagine how many disposable cups each individual would go through during the holy month. Therefore, to reduce our impact on the environment and reduce the cost spent on disposables, please support us by bringing your own mug to mosque when attending for iftar programs. Thank you all in advance for your support with this. Zohar Salah will be recited in Jama'a in the center tomorrow. Namaz will be recited at awal waqt which will be 12.15 p.m. This will be followed by, let's, by the Let's Talk Fiqh session for ladies and gents to be held in the gents main hall, facilitated by Sheikh Fazle Bas Datu. Last week's session was very informative and we encourage Mu'mineen to take advantage of these sessions and attend in large numbers. After Zohrain Salah, there will also be the Ramadan children's sessions that will be held for all the children who have pre-registered. These sessions will be held in the ladies section of the main hall and in Darul Zahra. I'd like to remind Mu'mineen to kindly register for programs well in advance to assist the volunteers and catering team with appropriately catering for iftar. The registration forms take about 30 seconds to fill out and they help us ensure that we are catering for the right numbers thereby reducing food wastage. Please try and register at least two or three days in advance for each program and the forms for the next sessions have been circulated via email and WhatsApp. For the next two nights, we are honored to be hosting Sheikh Shabar Mahdi for the Majalis. Sheikh Shabar Mahdi was born in London. He completed his education at the University of London, obtaining a degree in Islamic studies while simultaneously studying Hausa studies both in London and in the holy city of Qum. He has taught Arabic grammar, logic, jurisprudence, and usul al-fiqh. Sheikh Shabar is a trustee for a number of religious and charitable organizations in the UK and Europe, and is also the author of Shi'i Jurisprudence, Development and Growth. Kindly join me in welcoming him to the member with three loud salawat, ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والسيد المرسلين الذي سمي في السماء بأحمد وفي الأرض بأب القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين المذلومين المنتخبين المنتجبين 
الذين كلامهم نور وأمرهم رشد ووصيتهم التقوى وفعلهم الخير وعادتهم الإحسان وسجيتهم الكرم لا سيما على مهدي هذه الأمة وطاوس أهل الجنة الحجة ابن الحسن الأسكري أرواحنا في دايع ولعنة الله على أدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن قارون كان من قوم موسى فبغى عليهم صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Holy Quran speaks about three different people or three different challenges that Nabi Musa alayhi salatu wa salam faced. For Musa al kalim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about arguably the greatest challenge that he faced, which was the challenge of Musa salamullah alayhi with Fir'aun. But also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about two other difficulties and things that Musa al kalim had to face in his life, two other fitna. One of them being the fitna of Samuri, that person that used to be a believer and was from the people of Musa and was from the Israelites who later then caused the people of Musa to worship idols. And the third being what Quran al Karim refers to as Qarun, the one who was a transgressor. And tonight in our discussion, I wish to look at the story of Qarun and see what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran about this personality. For we're told as Quran al karim mentions, Qarun is in actual fact a relative of Musa salamullah alayhi. With most people believing that Qarun was the cousin of Musa. And when you look in his life, even though we may not have complete details, from the time that he was born until the time that he was dead about his biography and the details of his life. But we know certain key things that I wish to analyze. But the first thing that we're told about this individual is that when he accompanies Musa والسلام, through the river Nile and he is of those that sees the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when Allah Azza wa Jal splits the Nile not only that, he settles with Musa al kalim afterwards as they settle first in the deserts of Egypt and later they enter into the promised land. And we're told that Qarun realized that it was very important and vital for him. After now being safe from Fir'aun and the dhulm that he committed, that it was important for him to gain knowledge of scripture. And so we're told that Qarun not only is a believer in one God, not only is he part and parcel of the community of Moses, والسلام, but likewise, he trains himself until he becomes an alim, that of the people of Musa, عليه, of the ones that were followers of one God and the God of Musa, Arguably one of the best people that knew the Torah from back to front was this person by the name of Qarun. And so not only is he a believer, but we're told that he's also an alim and a scholar. And here therefore is the first part of my analysis before we can even look at what takes place and what he does to Musa al kalim alayhi salatu was salam is that in Quran al kareem and in the history of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's messengers Often you'll find this idea that there is a scholar or a person of knowledge who becomes worse than the believers that exist at that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was telling us something very important. 
that if you have knowledge, but you don't couple that knowledge with action, or if you have knowledge and you don't couple that knowledge with tazkiyah of your nafs, then if that person becomes astray, he becomes more dangerous than when a normal believer becomes astray. When a normal believer becomes astray, they misguide themselves. But when a person of knowledge doesn't do tazkiyah of their own nafs, and doesn't act upon that which they know, not only are they themselves misguided, they misguide those around them also. And so what we found about Qarun is that even though he's an alim and a scholar, because he didn't do tazki of his own nafs, and because he didn't act upon that which he knew, he was led astray. For if I want the secret to my success in this world, in regards to my position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone may ask the question, how can I get as close to my Lord as possible? What is the way that I can ascend to such a state that I am as close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as possible? The answer is this, have knowledge of the religion of your Lord and act upon it. If you do these two things, you will see yourself spiritually ascend towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how many examples of this did we have in history? That people that not only were knowledgeable of scripture, of Quran al kareem of texts, of sharia, of ahkam, but because their nafs was pure, they reached the highest levels that a servant can reach on this earth. Let me give you an example. We have a person who lived during the time of the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. who initially is not a Muslim, by the name of Mukhayriq. Mukhayriq is of the non-Muslims that lives in Medina. And Mukhayriq, according to the historians, was very wealthy, but also very knowledgeable. He had knowledge of the scriptures, the previous Abrahamic scriptures. He had knowledge of Sharia. He used to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one God. We're told that when the Prophet of Islam migrates to Medina, to Al-Munawwara, there are the non-Muslims that live there already. When the Prophet of Islam then migrates to Medina with Jam'un min al-Muslimin, with a group of Muslims, the Muslims come to the non-Muslims and they make an agreement. They say, look, you live in Medina, we live in Medina. We're not here to harm anyone. We're here to live and believe in the Prophet of Islam and his Lord. You also wish to live peacefully with us. To both of us, Medina is something dear, it's something that we wish to have and keep safe. Therefore, because both of us, these groups, live in Medina to Munawwara, let's make an agreement. And that agreement is that if any of our lives are in danger, if there is a group of people from Quraysh that come to attack us or come to attack you, your livelihood is in danger, your life is in danger. If one group is at risk of their life, the other one will come and support them. And so the non-Muslim said that this makes sense. If our lives are in danger, the people of the Prophet will come and support us. If their lives are in danger, we shall support them also. And so we're told that eventually what takes place during the time of the Battle of Uhud is that the lives of the Muslimin is in danger from the Quraysh. And so when these Muslimin prepare themselves to defend them and their honor and their lives, they come to the non-Muslims. And they come and say that we made an agreement a few years ago. Honor that agreement and help us and defend us and protect us. And so we're told that the day that this war or this battle started was a day on which these non-Muslims would spend on ibadah. Like today on a Friday, we're told to do certain things. To beautify yourself, to cut your nails, to groom, to do worship of your Lord. And there are different times of the day of Jumu'ah where more things are recommended than others. Recite this in the morning, recite this close to Ghurub. Likewise, they had this kind of program for themselves on that day. And so a group of them, when they were told, come and uh, honor your agreement and defend the Prophet of Islam and his people, they said, we would love to. But today is a time of ibadah. It's a day of worship for us. We can't leave these things and go and defend him. This is a day of worship. 
If it was any other day, we would stand and honor our agreement. Here we're told this Mukhayriq, what did I say? Not only does he have knowledge, without knowledge you are left without any direction. If a person doesn't have knowledge of their religion and of ahkam, they are like wild sheep. Sometimes they're made to go in this direction, sometimes you're made to go in that direction. Mukhayriq has knowledge, not knowledge of Quran al Karim. Knowledge of the scriptures of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. But he also had purified his nafs. He realized that in our sharia, his sharia, not the sharia of the Prophet of Islam. In our sharia, what is more important? To do ibadah on this day or to protect the lives of those that we have promised to protect? Mukhayriq stands up. He says, if all of you shall not do so, I will go myself. And so he leaves them, he urges them to come, they don't come. Mukhayriq, as I said, is very wealthy. He comes first to his wife and children. He says, every single amount of money that I have, I have gifted it to the Prophet of Islam. This is my last will. Then he goes towards the battlefield and some historians say that before he entered into the battlefield, he recites the Shahada and becomes a Muslim. Others say, no, he died like this, but he died a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. He becomes a Shaheed of Uhud. Not only did he reach such a status, that he stood alongside the Prophet of Islam, amongst the people of Uhud, not only that. However, also the houses that he had, the gardens that he had, we're told he had seven gardens in Medina. All were gifted to the Prophet of Islam. And these were used to support Islam during the formative period in Medina. How did he reach such a status? That some say the, the, the garden of Fedek used to be his ownership that he then gifted to the Prophet of Islam. How did he reach such a status? He reached such a status because not only did he have knowledge, he purified himself. He acted upon the knowledge that he had, that he reached his ascension in this world. And so when it comes to Qarun, the reason why that person who has extensive knowledge of the Torah becomes astray and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends his punishment on him is that that knowledge didn't take him closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That knowledge was on one side, the sins that he committed and the transgressions that he performed were on another. Here we're told, therefore, that Qarun initially is someone who is with Musa. As I said, he has knowledge, he doesn't practice. But there was one turning point that changes him from a believer into a person of disbelief. And that is that Quran al-Karim mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him more wealth than anyone during that time. That Qarun becomes so wealthy Quran al Karim says that he needed a number of people just to carry the keys for the storage where he would keep his wealth in. That he has so much wealth, the keys require a number of, of youth to be carried so that he can enter and access his wealth. And this tells us something else about this world. For as you'll see in this story and as Quran al Karim mentions, wealth necessarily wasn't a bad thing. Quran al Karim refers to wealth as khair, as that which is good. Because with wealth, you can gain akhirah. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detested wasn't wealth, was love of the dunya. Qarun is someone that was given so much wealth, what was the effect that that wealth had on him? We have a narration from Amir al Mu'mineen, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. Where he says intoxication is of four types. Normally I think intoxication, I think alcohol. Whereas Quran al Karim also mentions different types of intoxication. Amir al-Mu'mineen says the first type of intoxication, yes, is intoxication of khamr, of wine and alcohol. He says the second type of intoxication, the intoxication of sleep. Sometimes I wake up from the, during the time of Fajr, but I'm still half asleep. I pray my salah, it's as if I'm in a state of intoxication. Meaning if someone was to ask me a certain question at that time, I don't know what's going on. I don't have my senses. I'm in the intoxication of naum or the intoxication of sleep. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, likewise, we have two other types of intoxication. 
And it seems that these other two are much worse than the first two. The first, alcohol. The second, sleep. He says, the third, the intoxication of wealth. For you have seen yourself, for you have heard in your lives. You may have seen one person before, he didn't have that much wealth. After they gained some wealth and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them rizq, they became a different person. You don't recognize them anymore due to the wealth that they have. Why? Because that wealth sometimes brings a type of intoxication. Where you don't recognize who is in front of you, you forget your values. He says the fourth type is the intoxication of power. For how many times have I seen someone get a, the smallest position available? The position isn't even a big position. A small position in their community, in their society, in their workplace. But suddenly they are intoxicated by the power that they gain. And so they are unable to think straight. And so the point where we saw that Qarun changed from a believer to a disbeliever was this. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showered him with his mercy. He became the richest person of all of the people of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, and that is when he became intoxicated. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't hate wealth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what wealth sometimes does to a person. Let me give you an example before I take the, the discussion further. A group of companions, they said one day we're walking with the Prophet of Islam Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, Outside Medina, we're traveling. We reach a certain point, the Prophet of Islam says, We're thirsty, let us see if we can get some milk or something to drink. There are farmers here. And it is very normal during that time when you're traveling, you stop, you ask someone, they feed you. This is part of the norm. So they stop a farmer and they say to him, Do you have any milk for us? So the farmer says, Look, currently there is milk. My animals have milk, but this milk is for to, uh, this afternoon and the other milk that is there is for my family tomorrow morning. So I would love to have given you some, but I've already done the hisab. What is there now is for what we're going to drink as a family in the afternoon. And what is left is that which we'll, we, uh, we shall use tomorrow. So the Prophet of Islam says no problem. The Prophet of Islam raises his hands and does a dua for him. He says, Ya Allah, give him abundant wealth. They carry on, they see another person. Prophet of Islam says, stop him. They stopped him, they said, do you have anything for the Prophet of Islam? We're traveling. He says, what would the Prophet of Islam require? He says, we just want milk to drink. So this person, the animals that are there, he takes all the milk that is present and gives it to the Prophet. Then he brings other animals that he has at another location. And all the milk that is there, he gives to the companions. Then he sacrifices an animal, he cooks food and gives it to the Prophet of Islam. Rasulullah also puts his hands up in dua. But this dua is different to the first. The first dua, O oh Allah, give him rizq abundantly, shower him with his wealth. The second dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is, O oh Allah, give him enough rizq to cover his expenses and that which he needs. So the companions, they said, Ya Rasulullah, you did the opposite. So what do you mean? This is for the first person who didn't give you anything. You should have said, Oh Allah, give him enough to cover what he needs. For the second one, you should have said, Shower him abundantly with your wealth. Why did you do the opposite? He says, No, you didn't understand. That person was intoxicated by his wealth. The punishment that he gets in this world is Allah showers him with his wealth. He becomes further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second person, he has wealth. It hasn't reached the level where it's intoxicated him. He still thinks straight. He doesn't have love of dunya in his heart. And so I prayed for him that this remains. I told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give him wealth, but not so much that he forgets his Lord. And so the idea is that Qarun, due to that intoxication, forgot Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the message of Musa. And so we're told that when people saw the wealth of Qarun, and they saw the arrogance of this person, he's given a number of pieces of advice. And Quran al karim mentions those pieces of advice, and there is a difference of opinion amongst Mufassireen as to who the giver of advice is. 
were these two or three pieces of advice given to him by Musa alayhi salatu was salam or were they given to him by the other ulama and scholars that were there? It seems that it was a group of people, a group of people of knowledge. They came to him. They said, oh uh, Qarun, do good to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has done good to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showered you with wealth. Do good to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. Worship him. And this money that you have, as I said, money is not a bad thing. Use that wealth to gain the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something. You can build an orphanage. You can do this. You can do that. Use that money for the akhirah. And then they gave him a third piece of advice. And this is very interesting. And they said, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a system on this earth. That which you require and need will be given to you. Whatever is extra, you are unable to use it. He says, what do you mean? Today, you, for example, bought food for 100 people. You're on your own. You bought food for 100 people. Can you finish that food? Can you eat all of that food? You'll eat a maximum amount. And then you'll reach a, 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 a level where you can't eat anything further. The rest will always be taken by others. This is a principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed in this world. I, the money that I have, I use it on myself. But then I reach a limit. I physically am unable to use any more. No matter how many houses I have, I'll reach a limit where physically I can't live in all of them. Even if I had this many houses and I was there one, one house every month, I reach a limit. I'll have certain houses that I'm not using. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, eventually you will reach your limit and all that is extra will be the nasib and the shares of others. Meaning what? Meaning either it will be the share and it will go into the ownership of your family. When you die, you didn't use it, it went to your children. Or that food that you threw away, it became the share of a homeless person that ate it. Or it became the share of the animals that ate the risk that you didn't eat. So Qarun was being told, you have all this wealth, a lot of it you won't be able to use. So give it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quranul Kareem then mentions the response that Qarun gives to these people. And this is a response that you will find you hear often in your day-to-day -day life. You see a person who used to be poor. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed him with wealth. And often you tell them, give it to this person, give it to that person. They mention this response. Qarun says, when I gained this wealth, why did I gain that wealth? You're telling me to give it to that person and this person and gain my akhirah. The wealth that I had, why was it given to me? He says, the reason I was given that wealth is because I've got an aql. Because I'm knowledgeable. In other words, he said, I have worked hard for my own wealth. Those poor people can work hard for their wealth also. And this is what you often hear. Sometimes a person needs money. He comes to a rich person and says, I need to buy a house. I don't have feet, uh, food. I'm unwell. I need to pay for medical treatment. He'll say, in the way that I worked hard for my wealth, you also work hard for your wealth. Qarun didn't understand something. And that is that true ownership in this world only belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today you have clothing, today you have a house, today you have food. You believe that that is your ownership, it was never your ownership. We call this in Arabic, al-milkiyatul i'tibariyya. This aba that is on my shoulders, I don't own it. If I owned it, it would never go away from me. But when I die, it's separated from me. The only true owner of anything in this world is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why in Dua Jawshan al-Kabir you recite and inshallah you shall recite Ya Khair al warithin Oh the best inheritor. Meaning what? Meaning it always belonged to him. When I left this world, Allah re-inherited that which belonged to him. He gave it to you as an aman. And so Qarun said this is my wealth. I've owned it. I've worked hard for it. You should do so also. This reminds me of an example. And this example should show me and you the wealth that I have. How did it come to me? For often I become arrogant. I worked hard for this. It took me years, Methodan, to buy a house. This wealth, where did it come from? 
Take this example. I'm traveling from one city to another. And as I'm embarking on that journey, a person comes to me and says, you're going, Methalan, uh, from London to Manchester, isn't it? I said, yes. He says, look, in Manchester, my family are there. My family live in Manchester. And it's been a while that they don't have anything to eat. I live in London, they're in Manchester. Can you take this as an amana, 500 pounds as an amana? I said, no problem. If you want me to take this money for your family, I'll take it. So as I'm about to take it, he says, actually, look, because you're doing a favor for me, you're taking this money for my f wife and children that are in Manchester, from this 500, you keep 400. 100 pound of it, give to my family. Is that okay? It's no problem. Would any of us, if we were given that deal, someone came to me with 500 pounds for his family, then he said, you keep 400. You're doing a favor for me. Just give 100 to my family. Would any of us take that 400 and take the 100 also? Of course not. 100 he wants to give to his family only. The majority he's placed in my pocket. This is the example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, me and you and fuqara. For in the way that this person in this example says, my family are there, give them a part of that money, the rest belongs to you. Likewise, in the riwayat, we're told, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Fuqara Ayali. The poor people are like my family. I gave you wealth. I gave you that salary that you earned. I said, give a portion of that to those poor people. In actual fact, all of it belonged to me. I said, you can keep it, give a portion of that to those people. If even then I didn't give it to them, what type of person would I be? For all wealth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they came to Qarun with these three pieces of advice, and Qarun didn't listen. In fact, Qarun does something that Quran Kareem mentions in response to this advice of these people. For when he hears them telling him, given the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Qarun wishes to show his wealth. And so we're not sure exactly how he does so. And historical reports are different in regards to what he does, but he begins to show all of the city the wealth that he has. And so there is some sort of parade, and he parades on animals, all of the gold that he has, all of the wealth that he has, so everyone can see the money of Qarun. And here then, Quran al Karim mentions two different types of people. And compare it with yourself, when if you were to see great amount of wealth today, what would be your reaction? When the people of Musa saw this great amount of wealth of Qarun, Quran al Karim says the people were split into two. One group of people said, if only we could have wealth like Qarun had. In other words, what they saw when a person is showing his wealth, they believe to be positive. Why? Why is it that they saw that and they believed it to be something good? If only we had that. If only we could be in his position. The reason is, is that sometimes I, as a human being, I'm aware that I don't have the qualities within me that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wishes for me to have. Sometimes I know that. But when I see someone with those qualities, I realize that that's a good thing. What do I mean? I'll explain with an example. I, for example, know that I shouldn't be stingy. I should be generous. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the generous one. But I'm stingy. I know I shouldn't be. But when I see someone in my community or society that is generous, I realize this is a good thing. I look at them and say, if only I could be like that. This is one type of person. I know, for example, that I don't have knowledge. But when I see someone having knowledge of Quran al Kareem, I say, that's a good thing. I wish I could be like that. This person, this first person, he has a chance. That person is able to inculcate those qualities if they work hard. But you have a second type of person. For this second type of person, the problem is worse. That person himself is arrogant. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, be humble. But when he sees a humble person, he doesn't like them. The first person sees humility, understands that humility is a good thing. Understands that that person is a good person. 
The second one, that arrogance is so deeply rooted in his heart or in her heart that not only are they themselves arrogant, they only wish to see arrogant people around them. That according to them, arrogance becomes something mahboob, something good. When they see an arrogant person, they wish to be like him. This was the situation of those people. That not only do you have love for dunya in your heart, when you see someone far away from dunya, you say, I don't want a person like that. And we unfortunately, sometimes we have this in our minds. I myself am indulged in the world. If I see someone far away from the world, what's this person doing? Why is he doing that? Instead of realizing that that person is doing something good. And so these people, the first group of people, they reacted in this way. If only we could have wealth like him. The second group of people, Quran Karim says, are those with Iman and those who were given knowledge. And their response to Qarun, they said, yes, he has shown us great amounts of wealth. And we have never seen wealth like this before in this dunya, but the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are much greater than this. For no matter how much wealth you have in this world, it, is no, it has no comparison to the wealth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran al Kareem then says that once Qarun has shown his wealth to the people, then finally the final incident that takes place in his history leads to his destruction. And within this incident is a very important message for me and you, especially during Shah Ramadan. What took place? Musa Salamullah Ali teaches his people Sharia slowly. In the way that the Prophet of Islam Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam The laws that we have of the Sharia didn't come from the beginning in Mecca to Al-Mukarramah. They gradually came to the people when they were ready to accept these things. Musa Salamullah one day comes to his people and says from today, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that you must give zakat. A proportion of your money has to go to charity. Many people, many believers, they'll believe everything and they'll act on anything. As soon as it comes to something to do with wealth and money, it's very difficult for them. This is their ibtila. This is their test. Anything else you tell me to pray all night, I'll pray all night. You tell me to give me give khums, it becomes difficult for me. Because it's to do with money. So Qarun, when he was told, I now have to give a proportion of my wealth. And of course, when you have more wealth, the zakat, the khums, the sadaqah is more. He says, now you're telling me that I have to give a large amount of wealth to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. He didn't want to believe it. He didn't want to accept it. And so here Qarun does something. And this is a sign for me and you. When I want to realize when a person truly is misguided. For sometimes I don't accept something. I don't believe something. It's difficult for me to accept or practice. But I keep it there. You might have a person... They themselves, they don't give khums. It's difficult for them. Fine. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall deal with that person in the way that he wishes to. But sometimes you have a person. They themselves don't practice. They misguide others around them also. This is the worst creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You it didn't make sense to you. You didn't practice. Why then do you take others away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also? This is a sign of someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken his mercy away from them. It didn't make sense to you, don't do it. Don't tell others also so that they shall be misguided. So that your questioning will be increased on the day of Qiyamah. Qarun says, I don't want to give this zakat. But he told a group of people around him, why should we give this money? He gathers a number of people from his community. They respect him because he has money. He says, look, Musa told us to pray, we prayed. He told us to leave our own, we left him. He told us to do this, we did it. But now, Musa is telling us to give zakat. Do you know what this is? He said, what is this? This is Musa wishing to take our money and spend it on himself. I mean, he's made up this excuse of zakat so he can spend it and use it for himself. So these people, they said, you're right. Why would he ask us to give money? Something's wrong here. And so then Qarun says, I will make a plan and this will be the destruction of Musa. 
And according to some riwayat, one of the reasons he did so also, did so also, is because he wished to have the leadership of the people of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam for himself. And so he gets a woman. He tells her, in front of Musa, you will give false, false witnessing that haram has taken place between you and Musa. And we'll give you this amount of money. She says, no problem. The next day, Musa والسلام, is preaching to his people. Qarun comes forward. Musa alayhi, says, do this, don't do this. Allah says, this is haram. Allah says, this is haram. Allah says that these type of relationships are forbidden. And if someone does so, they shall be punished in this world and the next. So Qarun says, Ya Kalim Allah, Allah will punish in this world and the next, even if you were to do that action. So Musa says, yes, even if it was me that performed that action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would punish me. So Qarun says, I am ready to prove that you have performed that sin in this world also. Musa is shocked. Qarun says, if I have proven it, we should punish you in, in, in front of everyone. Musa والسلام, says, what are you talking about? They bring that woman. That woman, we're told as soon as, as soon as she comes in that gathering, and she sees the face of Musa والسلام, she's unable to say that which they had told her to say. Musa والله, comes to her and says, by the name of my Lord, you will say only but the truth. When he takes oath of Rabbul Alameen, that woman immediately confesses everything. And says that these people wish to frame you and punish you so that Qarun could take the leadership for himself. At that moment in time, Quran al Karim says, Musa asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send his punishment on Qarun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Musa, you pray for it, I'll give it to you. But I said, there's a message here in this incident, this final incident that takes place. Musa والسلام, prays once. The other people that were also involved, the punishment came on them also. Musa prays once. A third of Qarun goes under the, the earth. The earth swallows one third of him. When Qarun realizes, realizes what is happening, he looks at Musa and says, Ya Kalim Allah, forgive me. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done what I have done. But we're told in the books of history, Musa is so enraged at that time, he does the dua a second time. When he does the dua a second time, two thirds of Qarun now are swallowed by the earth. Qarun looks at Musa again and says, Oh Kalimullah, forgive me. I shouldn't have done what I did. Musa says, No, I won't listen to anything that you say to me. La tazidni bi kalamik. He did it a third time and all of the earth swallowed him. When that took place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa and said, Oh Musa, it seems you weren't the creator of Qarun. He says, what do you mean, oh my Lord? He says, because he asked you three times, not once did you forgive him. I am the creator of Qarun. A person that has accused the Prophet of God. A person that wishes to punish falsely a Prophet of God. Look at how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about him. That person is punishable and shall be punished. But Allah said, if he had asked me only once for true forgiveness, I would have given him forgiveness there and then. If this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ready to treat someone like Qarun, if he had asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely for forgiveness, then me and you are trying to, believe, believe, trying to be believers in our Lord. Me and you are gathered here to remember our Lord. And therefore, what would be the response of my Lord? If in the nights of Shah Ramadan, I truly ask my Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. If he's willing to give his mercy, I would have forgiven him at that time because I am his creator. How would my creator have mercy on me and you? If in the nights of Shah Ramadan, we were able to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely for his forgiveness. And so we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these nights as we have entered the second 10 nights of Shah Ramadan. And as we are soon to come, to celebrate Imam Hassan alayhi salatu wasalam, to not only accept all of the things that we have placed in front of our Lord up until now, but to give us the strength to sincerely ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ilahi bil Hussein al-Wajih. 
وجده وأبيه وأمه وأخيه والتسعة المعسومين من ذريته وبني اغفر لأوليائنا وكف عنا عداءنا واشغله من أذانا وأذهر كلمة الحق واجعلها العليا وأجهذ كلمة الباطل واجعلها السفلى إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأموال تابع الله بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك رافع الدرجات إنك سامع الأصوات رحم الله من يقرأ الفاتحة تسبقها الصلوات We well, need a quick announcement before Ziara. Inshallah, tomorrow we are hosting uh, Wessex's first junior bake-off. The bakers have been busy at home uh, preparing their bakes for judging. Following the majlis tomorrow, we will announce the winners. And after the program, the cakes and cookies will be available to buy for one pound per piece in the courtyard. It will be completely cashless, so please bring your bank cards and support the Shah Ramadan fund by buying some treats made by the juniors to take home. السلام عليك يا رسول الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين السلام عليك يا فاتمة الزهراء السلام عليك يا خديجة الكبراء السلام عليك يا حسن المجتبى السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله الحسين وعلى تسعة المعصومين من ضريتك علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والحجة بن الحسن عجل الله فرجه وسهل الله مخرجه وظهور الأمر ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك Sawa, what's a matty of who fear or toy? 